And here we are back at it. Episode 9? 10, 11, I don't know, 11, 12 of the show. Um, had some fights on last night. Maybe call this a uh, prelim or a test fight companion. Hmm. Fight companion, I think, always has to occur while the fights are on. And it is a companion to the actual fights as they occur. Um, however, I've seen multiple, and often, eh, depending on the source, they can be uh, the actual fights with commentary, or they can be uh, conversations that loosely follow around it, or closely. Don't know. Um, it's the 25th anniversary of the UFC. November 1st, November 3rd, November 8th, I don't know, 1993, UFC 1. It was a um, diverse combat-oriented competition to a winner-take-all format. And uh, it took place in Denver, Colorado, uh, at the old stadium prior to Bronco Stadium being built. Um, they call it the old Mac. It was the McGregor or whatever. McDonald's, some individual. <clears throat> it was on the other side of the beltway. The beltway. The uh, throughway that goes around um, Denver. Adjacent to where the new Bronco Stadium is. It was in the parking lot of what is now the Bronco Stadium. And uh, it was that elimination format. So whomever won this fight would probably have to fight through, you know, two or three or four times during the night. And I think they had eight different or eight diverse combat techniques or combat uh, studies types. Um, they had jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, of course, with Hoist Gracie. Uh, spoiler alert, he won it all. Little dude in a gi, choking fools out with his gi, whatever. They had a massive sumo style wrestler. They had Ken Shamrock, uh, American wrestler. They had a Thai kickboxer. I think they had like a, um, a Danish fighter. Uh, I think they had like a Sabat or Sambo or I don't know. They're, bunch of stuff and there were no rules zero rules which led to uh, a lot of uh, controversy <laughs> and uh, I had a friend I have a friend out in Colorado who went to that with his other idiot friend two meatheads and they sat uh, with pretty good seats because this was not a well-known or a highly um, publicized event you know, sort of like Monster Truck before Monster Truck got big or whatever. So, yeah, hey, let's go out and see this thing, man. It's fighting. Uh, they unveiled the octagon, the eight-sided ring. And uh, because there were no rules, you could stomp on the individual when they were down, kick them in the head, and they had some brutal knockouts. Like the, the sumo-style sumo wrestler, who's like a 300-plus pound dude, took a kick from like the Danish whatever... I don't think it was kickboxing, I don't know what. With the shin right across his skull. <clears throat> yeah, brutal. Um, and uh, I think that brutality and the no rule caused controversy for multiple years afterward. You know, into the gaming commissions and then into Congress. I don't know, McCain or I can't recall who. This is brutal. You know, this is like the uh, gladiator sport. Ooh, this is not what America is doing. And Dana White and the Fertitas had to get involved and, you know, adopt the uh, Nevada Athletic Gaming Commission rules, the styles, uh, the boxing's built on, and probably had to grease a lot of palms and had to have, like, introductory, um, you know, uh, interfaces with individuals that didn't know anything about it to explain it and say it wasn't just base brutality there isn't a giant threat for uh, you know um, an individual 
getting killed in this thing. Boxing is probably more destructive because you take thousands and thousands of hits to the head with the big 16 ounce glove and it makes your head a noodle. This thing, you take one shot and you're out or you're choked out or you know, whatever. A bit more real, a bit more humane, like the bare knuckle boxing, you right? And uh, big John McCarthy, he had to write and then uh, demonstrate and share and explain all the rule set. I mean, this thing had some work behind it. And uh, it grew from there, 25 years. Whew. What a difference. It had the giant logo, the big bald guy that's standing on the earth with his hands out like uh, my 12-year-old, you know, daughter drew it sort of doodly and it was multicolored red and green and the earth was blue and green and you know like wow and they stuck that in the middle of the octagon in the fights on Saturday celebrating the 25th anniversary and oddly enough as I've talked with Tracy my wife and a lot, you know a number of other people um, with Phil out in Colorado the guy that went to UFC 1 um, you know this thing's had ebbs and flows and often, these giant cards that they um, spend millions of dollars uh, performing all of the media and the pressers and all of the commercialization and the marketing. I mean, they flood shit with it. Which didn't happen in this last McGregor fight. And it didn't happen in the last McGregor fight because McGregor said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not your monkey anymore. I'm not getting on planes flying around the world. I've got $100 million or whatever. I've got $50 million. I've got a lot of money. You guys need me to fight. I'm going to sponsor my own new alcohol. Proper 12. Proper 12. It was going to be called the Notorious. That's already used for a scotch. So he couldn't use Notorious. It's a part of, I don't know who. I think the same company that uh, um, did the Proper 12. Um, he didn't go and do his own alcohol, his own scotch. He actually went to one of the established houses like, uh, um, and it's a scotch. It's not a single malt. So I, I can't remember it right now. You'd know it if I uh, said the name. Um, but it's a blend. And he went to them. And his is like three years. A scotch has to have a minimum of three years in the barrel to be called a scotch. Um, and so his met that minimum. Uh, the, re the reviews of the scotch were that it was immature, that uh, it was uh, a, a terrible giant guy logo, did the 25 years, had all kinds of work to get it there, um, had tons of trials and tribulations where, you know, they were down millions and millions of dollars, the Fertitas, I think that at one point they had 45 million bucks invested into it. And they said, nope, let's stick with this thing, turn it around, and, you know, here we are. A multi-billion dollar organization of hundreds of fighters, 500, 600 fighters across the globe um, with events weekly, monthly, purchased by, you know, huge rights purchased by Fox, the, uh, the Zufa rights, whatever. And then now ESPN, at the end of this year, it switches. Um, giant notoriety, awesome athletes. The athletes have totally um, evolved. And that was pretty clear when you looked at the fight techniques of these eight guys that were in UFC 1 uh, to the monsters that walked out here. But I, as I was talking, I talked about, um, you know, these fight nights and uh, like the Conor McGregor Khabib Nurmagomedov fight. And Connor, you know, had proper 12, and he was doing his alcohol. And that had to be a part of all the preparation, so that his alcohol, as I was saying, was three years old. It tastes a little, uh, you know, chemically or alcoholy. It's a little harsh. Doesn't have the smoothness and the flavor, whatever it picks up from the barrel. Ah. It's Bushmills. It's over there. Bushmills or whomever that brewery is and they're brewing his stuff and he puts his label on it and he can't put Notorious on it because it's already used and you're like, ah, oh, shit. What kind of Irishman or Scotchman or Welshman It doesn't have their own, you know, multi-millionaire doesn't have their own Scotch or uh, single malt whiskey or Scotch or blended Scotch. Yeah. So um, he did that. 
uh, he wasn't going to do all these pressers. He wasn't going to fly around the world. He wasn't going to market this thing. He didn't want to have to sit with Megan O'Leavy and with Karen Bryan and all the guys and do the WebExes and the interviews. He has his own production company, McGregor Productions. They were going to do the interviews. He had a little gentleman, an Irish gentleman, who interviewed him and did his half hour for questions or whatever. Didn't want to show up to these events, though. They realized maybe the draws, uh, the, the draw, the, the, um, uh, the uh, purchases for the event, not the seat pur purchases, but the pay-per-view buys. They wanted to bump those up and ensure. So they did the week out uh, interview or the two week out where they were in New York and actually showed up and he was late for those, didn't really care, had no real regard, brought his scotch on stage. And so when you're not part of the machine, but the machine needs you, he ran it the way he ran it. And the marketing wasn't there, like on the ones in the past that were huge. You know, like UFC 100 with Brock Lesnar in the group, or uh, the McGregor, um, uh, you know, fight with uh, the Diaz brother. And then the follow up fight, right? Those were huge, and that's why they were record setters. This one had two and a half billion, a million buys, so it was a record setter. But uh, it didn't have all that hype to it, which was weird. My son and I were still compelled to watch it, so we watched it. I mean, and it was uh, wingding. But a lot of those don't live up to the hype, and you're like, eh. And there's so much hype to it, maybe you're over-anticipating greatness. You know, with the Francis Ngannou who punches holes through brick walls. You know, it's like uh, unbelievable when you see the guy, and then the fight's not there. And then Cormier knocks out Stipe, and you're sort of shocked. It's sort of a good fight, but uh, this thing last night, which was the 25th anniversary fight night, holy buckets, man. Um, the uh, main card, the main event, was uh, a couple dudes that hadn't fought in a while. Um, and they've sort of been, I don't want to say MIA, but MIA. Um, Yair Rodriguez. A scrappy Mexican dude and uh, the Korean zombie, uh, Chan Sung Young. And the Korean zombie got that nickname because he would walk right through the punches. And he was he's a very good striker, had great stand up, and he'd walk through much like a Diaz brother, wear you down and beat you to sleep. Um, and he's been MIA for a while. He was in the military or he had some other obligations for a couple of years. Hey, I, I don't know. I don't want to say he didn't. He hasn't fought till, well, since 2013. It's been some obscene. And Yair Rodriguez uh, alternately sort of just disappeared, went quiet. And I don't know if it were, was personal or family or athletic or whatever items, but he hadn't fought. And this guy, uh, different fighting technique. Excellent kicks, low kicks, high kicks, great movement, awesome angles. Tall, sinewy, skinny dude. Korean Zombie's a shorter, stockier guy. Uh, so this thing was, you know, lining up. The fight makers, whoever made it, you know, lining up to be a killer. Um, the uh, co-main was Cerrone against Platinum Mike Perry. Because it's in Denver, um, right? The hometown of Donald Cerrone. Yeah, that's where he came out, you know, in 1990-whatever, 8, 2000, 2000, whatever, with the Tap Out crew. With mask and scrape and punk ass, they sponsored him. They found this dude. He was fighting out in like Wyoming and stuff. This uh, Midwestern dude with like a Muay Thai um, fight technique where he'd stand up and sort of just march at you with no head movement and kick you and knee you and punch you. Good striker, lean, sinewy, scary dude, sort of emotionless. Um, against Platinum Mike Perry, the mohawk with the tats and the big mouth and just a rock head as thick as a, a house. And so this thing went off and uh, it's a freebie. It starts late here in the, in the uh, East Coast, right? It starts at 7 or 8, the fights, and then 10 o'clock the car kicks off and so by like 12.31, 1.30 you're still watching fights. But it was in Denver, which is two hours behind, so you know, you had your main fight, your main card fight, um, main event at 10, 30, 11, and back in California an hour earlier. So 
I guess it works across the country. I just hate staying up late. But man, um, there were some incredible fights. Lots of blood, great technique, a lot of heart, multiple, um, you know, there were a handful of just shocker knockouts. Some of them were at the end of the freaking fight. Um, if you hadn't, if you didn't watch these things, I'm sure you can, you know, YouTube them or whatever, but good God. And it's free. And I've found that these free cards often have these younger or um, lower um, ranked fighters who have more hunger, more desire to climb up the ladder, uh, more focus, more drive, you know, maybe more, um, more anxiety. You know, more fear that this is the their last shot or this is their first shot at the card. So they bring it. And it was a fabulous fight night, which I did intend to watch. But awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of great fights. Uh, it had, um, uh, what the heck's his name? Uh, he's the Irish fighter, Paul, uh, uh, whatever, he was one of the commentators, and uh, another young guy who hasn't done a lot. He's new to the Fox crew. It wasn't your typical, you know, like Cormier, Dom, and Rogan, or your non-pay-per-view, um, Anik, you know, and uh, whomever, if it's abroad, one of the European fighters, or if it's here. Um, you know, uh, Dom or um, Paul Felder. Paul Felder was the fighter that uh, was the color commentator on this. Sharp kid! And they kept showing clips of him being smashed in the head, which he spoke on by Platinum Mike Perry. Ooh, guy's got heavy hands. But a diverse commentary crew, which is cool. Brian Stan used to do the commentary. He's military. I don't know if he's still active or ex- Excellent commentary. I love when he does that. Paul Felder, great commentary. Awesome dude. Well spoken. Understands the technique. Visualizes and sees and interprets. Is able to share it well. Um, Jimmy Smith they brought over. Rogan always told him, get Jimmy Smith from, uh, you know, um, Bellator or wherever the hell he was. Showtime, I don't know, but he was the color commentator over there, and he's as good as, as Rogan. Unfortunately, like this one, they put him at the desk. So he's with Karen Bryant and with um, Rashad Evans and Jimmy Smith out in California at the Fox Studios, where usually you have like Cormier, Karen Bryant, and Michael Bisping, or Dom, or um, Tyron Woodley. And they're rotating these guys in and out. I think it's awesome. And most of these guys are well spoken. Rashad, eh, he struggles a little. Mm. I mean, he does a decent job, but he's not as fluid. I mean, Woodley even is a better commentator. Bisping, fabulous. The Brit, just well spoken, charismatic. He's got the crooked eye. <laughs> what are you talking about? He's had that eye for years now. He's not going to fix the eye until he's done fighting. No more fighting. Then they'll go and they'll surgically fix it. The retina detached, whatever. Um, they sort of fixed it. He got hit again or took a deep thumb uh, up into the eye. I think it was multiple pokes, which has always been a problem. The open-fisted, open-fingered gloves so that you can push and stuff and then eh, and they try to manage it. And there's, all, um, there's always some catastrophic eye pokes and face and eye rakes and slices your eyelid open you know with the with the the, uh, the part of the glove the finger whatever or your finger goes straight in there and if you haven't had eye pokes like if you haven't wrestled or if you can't recall when you were a kid and somebody poked you in the eye oh it goes black and white and spotty and rings and waters and you can't keep it open and you can't see and this one's affected those guys keep fighting. Yeah, they're brutal. Just like a strike to your nose. If you've never been hit in the nose, screwing around or anything, somebody pops you in your nose. Your whole face rings. It stings. Your eyes you can't see. 
it's unbelievable. They keep fighting. 103 minutes, right? Uh, it's an hour, hour and 10 minutes or something. It was a big fight. But these things are so long. Then they have some commentary. And then last night, I don't remember which fight it was. Uh, I don't recall. It could have been the Dariush Moises. Uh, they had a... No, 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 no. It was the Skelly against the Moffat fight. Skelly's a little kooky, man. He's a squirrely-eyed guy all fired up. He was a prelim. Um, and they had uh, Hamos against Gunther. Hamos destroyed Gunther. Uh, it's so weird they set some of these fights up, and I think they're trying to give the fighter the rebound. You know, let's see how you're going to perform after whatever. Jeffrey and I, they're like, dude, Gunther again. And he got mauled in, like, the first minute. Hamos came out and just freaking destroyed him. And you're lying face down. Which is how the uh, zombie Rodriguez fight went. Oh my god. These two traded for five rounds. Zombie was up. They were both a bloody mess. Zombie did not look like he had ring rust or lack of experience. He brawled. And he slowly was getting the jab and the punches in on Yair. Bloodied up his face, messed up his jaw. You could see Yair had his mouth open in the round, fourth round, fifth round, like he had to be breathing. Um, Rodriguez had these kicks going, was destroying the front leg, the lead leg of the zombie. Smart, right? But the zombie's still pressing through, doing body kicks, doing high kicks, doing front teats, doing front kicks, either to the midsection with the ball of the toe or up to the chin. A few that he'd make or miss. He was doing downward hammer punches to like the freaking uh, collarbone. He'd do spinning back fists. One of the most creative fighters. And I think because of that, he doesn't have the punching technique and power that boom, you drop him, right? And it's weird. Fighters usually have that or not. And if they do have one hit, one punch knockout power, even the smaller guys, they're usually very good with technique. Usually. Once in a while, like uh, Platinum Mike Perry, the guy just flails and he's just got massive arms. He hits you with one of those clubs and it could knock you out. Which is what exactly Cerrone did not want. Cerrone's one of these cats who, through attrition, lost the chin. He's had some brutal fights where his jaw was broken, right? And in the third, fourth, fifth, or in the second, third round, you watched him with his mouth open, blood just dripping out of it, trying to breathe. Um, because his face was smashed, his jaw was broken, his nose was broken. And dude, when your jaw's open like that, you're taking shots, and they had to wire it shut and surgically, you know, uh, repair it. Donald comes back. And then he had this whole fallout with Winkle John and Jackson, right? Then at the club in the, 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 uh, the gym in Albuquerque for 15 years, as long as he's been fighting, man. Went from Denver down to Albuquerque, trained with these guys. Greg Jackson's one of the greatest trainers in history. Brought in Mike Winklejohn, right? And Winklejohn's good, but he's more of the admin guy. And he brings in the other aspects of the fight game, right? If it's like, uh, you know, stamina, strength and conditioning, all that other jazz. Does a lot of the scheduling. Works up the events so that you have, you know, uh, multiple training with high-level partners and stuff. Like, Jackson's just a fight dude. And it seems... There was, but there's been talks. Cerrone said it on maybe Rogan, where um, Jackson sort of moved back, and Winkle John's been driving a lot more of the process of the gym, and he doesn't like it. He was there because of Greg Jackson. I mean, that was his guy. And then they bring Mike Perry in. Perry comes down to Albuquerque, joins, starts participating, and all of a sudden they're going to back him. Jackson Winkle John's going to back. Perry when he fights Cerrone and Cerrone's like what the fuck dude I've been here forever you guys are going to do this to me and he spoke outwardly about it on uh, Rogan and it had undertones of you know disappointment and anger and ugh, that nasty quality and that's not Donald it's weird and he openly stated that he was he felt that he's been slighted by the gym um, they went to Diego Sanchez who's an original guy like uh you know, he's old. He's been there longer than uh, Cerrone. And Diego's like, yeah, I don't know. He goes, yeah. And Cerrone goes out to his ranch, comes in and trains for his six weeks, eight weeks at the gym, brings in some team members, some coaches, maybe, maybe you know, moves around with the team, engages with it once in a bit, a bit, 
then disappears back out to his ranch because he's got a ranch out there with dozens or hundreds of acres and he's got a steel prefab building that he put his own gym in and he's got his own activity, plays frisbee golf, goes and hunts, rides his snowmobiles, his four wheels. Cerrone's the real deal dude, one of the strange, you know, throwbacks. Um, lives that life. And Diego's like, yeah, he does. He never really helped on fight preparation for the rest of us. Never really involved in our camps. Uh, sitting in our corner, backing us, going to our fights wherever we were fighting. That's not Donald. So for him to state that uh, these guys have sort of uh, pulled out of his corner, reneged on their support of him, they went with Platinum Mike, uh, I wouldn't say so. I'd say Cerrone's sort of been MIA. Eh, you know, he sort of is what he is. So I can see why these guys went with uh, Platinum Mike Perry. And it caused this rift and there was bad blood in this thing. And Cerrone went out and um, he had a uh, calm of mind and a, and a center of focus. And he looked a little angry, unlike Donald usually does. Stare down. And Platinum Mike did his normal, like, yeah, I'm going to whoop your ass. And they went in there and Cerrone was sharp and was aware and didn't just walk forward with the Muay Thai and the kicks and was jabbing and tried to move and tried to do some grappling and tried to use some uh, you know, different angles and different, uh, different um, pressure and technique and didn't take any big shots because he can't anymore. Donald can't take shots on the chin. Goes out like a light. Just like the Iceman used to after a while, right? Um, you hit him in the jaw and now he's fighting Tito. He, got, he took shots, too many shots, and the chin got soft, and he dropped, and Donald does that now. You give him shots in the jaw, and he's done. You can see how it affects him quickly. He loses his uh, mobility. He loses his acuity. And then he's usually pounced on, knocked out, and, you know, he's crumpled in the corner as a mess. And Platinum Mike could have done that. Donald didn't let him. He willed the fight, um, got on top of him a bit. Then uh, there were some reversals. Uh, they made it out of the first round, I think. Maybe not. And then uh, Platinum Mike had him down, pinned against the cage. And, uh, you know, the Mad Irishman commentary is like, look, dude, you, I've rolled with Cerrone before. You can't keep your arms out like that. Bam. The legs go up, tried for the triangle, lost the triangle, came back down. Perry keeps his arms down like he's reaching over, haunching over. Donald's got his legs up. He goes right up over, foop, around the head. Puts the uh, arm bar right on him. Platinum tries to slam and get him off. It's over, dude. And he goes down, even tries to step roll over so he could get the arm out of there. Cerrone smash and rips his arm off. Boop, game over. That's impressive. And, um, you know, afterward... The commentators were talking about it like, yeah, this is a different Donald. It looks like he's got a level of focus. He brings his little four-month-old kid with the little earmuffs on. <laughs> brings him in the ring, walks him around. His wife, his grandma came in, and he's like, I saw that little dude, and I thought to myself, Donald tells this to while he's being interviewed. He goes, hey, nobody going to take food off that little dude's table. And he fought like he meant that. Won that shit. No-brainer. And you don't... You see Donald for so many fights where he head kicks or he strikes or he chokes, right? Does a rear naked or a standing naked or a, you know, guillotine. His submission game's fiendish off his back on the ground, but you don't see that. He saw it again here, dude. Deadly. He's like a spider. He's like the spider. He glommed on a platinum's arm and frickin' took it home with him. And you see him at the end. He arches it and he had a big old beard angry like you dude this is over i was like yikes i would have put money against donald nine out of ten times in that fight like dude but man that little four month old brought him something new a vigor something refreshed he was a force in that freaking ring now i don't know what happens from here because, you know, you get positive. You're like, I can keep fighting. He called out Khabib or something. So this was 155. He's dropping to 45. And he's going to, dude, McGregor or Nurmagomedov or Ferguson or um, the Hawaiian. Who's the other dude? 
they would maul Donald. They would mangle him. Dude, Khabib right now would probably mangle anyone. And this whole Ben Askren thing, and whatever the announcements are, and when this stuff's going to come out, dude, that gives me chills. Because you have two feet of... I didn't know how um, McGregor was going to come in. And he clearly was flat. There was clearly some ring rust. And unfortunately, much like Ronda Rousey or Gina Carano or some of these other cats were Hollywood and life and marketing and pressers and the machine itself start to eat up your time and you don't have the laser focus and you're not 10 hours a day in the gym doing cardio, doing strength and conditioning, doing uh, visualization, doing... Um, actual technique and training, not sparring, not taking the shots, staying healthy, rehabilitating the body. I mean, world-class athleticism, like your Olympians, like anyone, that's what these fighters are anymore. McGregor looked off, and he got mauled in that fight, dude. He got destroyed. That fight, I wish I did a companion or a presser for that, because Jeffrey and I watched that entire card. I don't know if there's going to be another card like that around for a while. November or whatever it was, uh, when was it, October 30th, no, September 30th, November 5th, I don't know, whatever it was, dude, that was unbelievable, that, October 6th, that fight card, that fight was epic, it gave me faith in the fight game again, whereas the last one where we had Stipe get knocked out by Cormier, and then Cormier called Brock Lesnar into the ring, get in here, you. And I'm like, here, here we go. Jeffrey and I sat here afterward. We're like, is the WWE going to, There, I think there's talk, and that's what ESPN is. It's going to combine these two brands. And Rousey went over to the WWE, right? You got the circus fakers with these maulers. And I get the machine is this big. It has to make this kind of money. I mean, I think they had to, they projected that, you know, this thing had to make 180, 200 million a year or whatever just to break even. Um, and it wasn't. If they don't have the draw, that thing had two and a half million draws in the McGregor Nurmagomedov fight. Two and a half million buys. Record gate pull when they fought in wherever, wherever the hell they fought, MGM or the new arena in Vegas. Fight didn't disappoint. Nurmagomedov is a fiend. A fiend. Oh my god. I'll watch that fight again. I'll either watch it online or I'll watch it on TV or whatever if they ever show that again. Epic. There were a couple fights that night that were epic. <sighs> my god, that was a great card. And uh, if Khabib Nurmagomedov comes back and fights, which he sort of has to, he's got fights left on his contract. I don't know if they, if they paid him, if they released his $2 million fund from climbing into the, as we all know, he jumped out of the ring and went after Connor's team who were yapping at him and blah, blah, blah. So uh, he fighting Ben Askren would be sick. I don't know who'd win that, man. Because if you look at Ben Askren over in Invicta or whatever the hell he's fighting in Bellator, he's been mauling people. And these people are not small, they're not, you know, Nobody's. These guys are world class fighters too. That would be an exciting fight. And then you got uh, Jones coming in. He's fighting Gustafsson, right? And who knows who's Cormier? Who Cormier's gonna fight? He's gonna fight Brock Lesnar with his million dollar fight. He's gonna retire from now. The champ, champ, double champ. Eh. He sure beat the crap out of uh, the Black Beast a couple weeks ago. Destroyed him. So. Lots of exciting stuff. Some good fights coming up again. It's it's impressive. I mean, the machine's been impressive, and I'm pleased to see that. Uh, you know, a few things in life that you find, and you're drawn to them. And because you're drawn to them, you have passion and interest. And because of that, you know a lot about it. You really, really spend time, and you're excited by it. I, that's where I'm at with the fight game. I love the MMA stuff. And what this thing's turned into, I wonder what the next 10 years will be. Good God.
it's exciting. I wonder how the switch over to ESPN is going to be. If, uh, you know, they're going to move all the fighters that are commentators over or not. How they're going to show it. I read some of the contract and how many, you know, what they're going to have to show, how many fights for the year, 14 or 18, so that's one a month. Um, and then they're going to have the fight library or something, you know, like fight pass, so you'll see all the paths. I don't know. These freaking contracts are so confusing and difficult, and they're all multi-billion dollar contracts, and then they tie them all. So